Buona tarda. Uh, welcome to our presentation, Reactive DDD Solving Complexity by Design. And this is Kevin, and I'm Vaughn. And uh, we're working together on a project called Vlingo. It's the Vlingo platform, which is a reactive platform. And uh, we're having a lot of fun doing that. The, uh, the original project is written in Java, plain Java, um, but we have capability to you know, support uh, Kotlin, no problem. You'll see a Kotlin demo a little bit later. And there's also a .NET version, which I know is probably the wrong thing to bring up here, but, um, and it, but you'll be happy to know it's lagging behind the Java one. So um, anyway, we want to talk about Domain-driven design first. How many here are familiar with domain-driven design in any way? Ah, great, wow, very good. So you know that uh, DDD is about the bounded context and the ubiquitous language. This is sort of the you know, foundation of DDD. We can use any of the tactical patterns that um, may come in useful to us, but without the bounded context and the ubiquitous language, we're really just not um, close to what DDD is, is meant to be and how it's meant to be used. So, and, and another aspect of DDD that's extremely important is the learning part of it. So think of DDD as a learning tool. Um, the reason for this is knowing where your context boundaries are and what model elements live in the bounded context and what their names are or what the terms are that, that explain the concepts of the model must be learned. And the breakthroughs come from finding the edge cases, from discovering the really complex uh, parts of, of what doesn't happen in the real world often, but what happens only because you're using software to augment uh, some form of, of the real world activities around us um, to optimize those, to make them simpler. So uh, consider DDD a learning tool. And I like to think of it this way, that learning begets knowledge and knowledge changes everything. So this is um, true, I think, in life in general. And also when we're designing software, we must acquire knowledge. Did you know that, that uh, in Scrum, there are four reasons to put a backlog item onto the product backlog? And when I ask students, for example, at my workshop, uh, DDD workshop, what are the four reasons to put uh, tasks into a backlog? And most of them know features. Some of them know bugs, which, you know, is pretty common. But there are two other reasons to put tasks into the product backlog. One is technical work, and the last one, knowledge acquisition. Do you ever put a sticky note onto your task board because you don't know enough about the domain that you're working in and you need to have a conversation with the business? This is extremely important. Treat DDD as a learning tool. If you're only using the tactical patterns, you're, you're really, I have to break it to you, it's not really the way that DDD was intended to be used. Because the tactical patterns based on the language and platform that you're using may change. And, and the, uh, even the concept of aggregate or value object could change based on the platform that you're working on. So um, use DDD to, to gain knowledge and change the world that you're de uh, developing software and to make it a better experience. So in talking about reactive DDD, we're of course uh, adding in the qualities of reactive software, which is message driven. So basically everything about the experience of reactive program programming is message driven. It could be a command message, it could be an event message, it could be some other kind of message, maybe even a document message. But message-driven is extremely important to embrace as part of 
reactive. Um, because of the message-driven aspect, the other three uh, qualities or characteristics are possible, and this is being responsive. So um, quick turnaround using, and responsive means that we're capable of using all threads available to um, the server at any given time and keeping you know, the percentage of, of uh, use of cores and, and threads up you know, uh, to near 100%. And uh, also resilient, um, reactive is resilient oftentimes because the design of reactive components can uh, provide isolation from other components. So it's not just encapsulation, but isolation. And this is a major factor that uh, Alan Kay spoke about with regard to um, uh, what object-oriented programming is. And then, of course, elasticity, meaning that you can, you know, sort of expand and contract systems as, as um, they need to according to load and demand. Now, um, you know, and then, of course, the business-driven aspects with domain-driven design. So what uh, Kevin and I are talking about today is the actor model. And uh, the actor model came about uh, the ideas of it probably three to five years after um, Alan Kay started his initial work on discovering or inventing object-oriented. And uh, th this was um, by a professor and doctor named uh, Carl Hewitt. And he and his colleagues invented a message passing approach to uh, use, use with objects. Now, I want to say, that this is extremely important. The message passing aspects of the actor model is basically the, the most important thing that Alan Kay meant for OO. And you probably, maybe you've heard this uh, famous statement that Alan Kay said that uh, when I was thinking about object-oriented pro programming, I can assure you that I didn't have C++ in mind. So, you know, the actor model is really the closest thing that we have today to what Alan Kay's ideas were about OO. Um, and, you know, of course, cores are not getting much faster. I had a, a conversation with Martin Thompson. I know he's here, but I don't know if he's in the audience yet. But he, uh, he told me that, um, uh, you know, the, the Moore's Law thing where we were seeing you know, doubling in, in speed of processor um, uh, was about a year and a half to two years was the, the, I think two years was the estimate we were seeing in about a year and a half. Now to see the same kind of speed growth that we were seeing before the year 2003 takes about nine years. Okay, this, this is a rough estimate. And then there's also the matter of specter and meltdown, right, where um, the OS is now protecting certain aspects of, of um, you know, vulnerabilities in the computer that tends to slow our software down. So obviously we want to use uh, the processor cores as, um, as efficiently as we possibly can. And in order to do that, um, this message-driven approach to software development with, with objects uh, you see here that there is a sender object and a receiver object, and the sender object is sending a message to the receiver. This happens to be in the form of a command message. This is an imperative that says, do this, okay? And uh, when, the, when the sender sends this message to the receiver, the sender does not block, nor does the receiver block to receive that message. So the actor model is a non-blocking uh, approach. The design of an actor world such as um, Vlingo is designed to not block any of the components at all. And that means that as soon as the sender sends a message to the receiver, the sender continues on its own thread of execution. And whenever there's a thread that is uh, uh, available for the receiver to process a message that ends up in its mailbox, it will be given a thread. And the idea with the actor model then, especially on, on uh, modern archi hardware architectures, is that the threads are being you know, um, 
allocated for different actors at any given time, and all together, all of the actors working together are processing more data and business logic than, than what is capable with most non-reactive uh, software. Another benefit of the actor model, what I have found, is that it greatly simplifies the architectures that we're working in. And sometimes, I, I must say, we're, uh, some architects will, will take pride in the number of layers that they can create in their software. Um, I've been down that road, and it's just not really very pleasant, in my opinion. And I, and I look for ways to, to reduce the number of layers in the architecture. Uh, of course, I've only been doing this for like 36 years, so don't take my word for it that I'm, <laughs> I'm tired of that old way of, of thinking. Uh, so with the actor model, you really have like basically two layers in your software. You have what would be considered like the, the port adapter or the web controller layer, um, and then you have your domain model. And the, like for example, a REST endpoint can simply uh, receive a request asynchronously and dispatch that request as a fluent uh, business logic request or command that is handled asynchronously. So everything is asynchronous and we've now just condensed our architecture down to two layers. But what about persistence? Where does the persistence go? It's abstracted away in the actor model and you comfortably just uh, emit events for example, out of, your, out of your actors, and the orange event that you see here will be automatically stored in, a, uh, in an event journal. So that's sort of a new way of thinking for most. So when you think about actors, think about actors done right, or objects done right. So um, this, again, uh, is you know, like a nod to Alan Kay, that actors are really um, most of what he had in mind for the OO or the object idea. So now let's take these two things and put them together, reactive and domain-driven design. What does that mean? What we're really talking about here is the fact that everything around the systems that you're developing when you're using reactive components is itself reactive. So the bounded context that you see, the green um, ellipses and the yellow circles within them are both reactive. So the bounded context itself, for example, as it has uh, rest endpoints or uh, message um, endpoints, whatever it happens to be that requests are coming in from the outside at that outer boundary, we are reacting to whatever stimulus arrives and and we are also producing events or other messages out of the yellow actors in the system and, and everything is, is running asynchronously. We have our storage, sometimes our storage is a query model, sometimes our storage is um, uh, the command model. These are separated to optimize uh, the access to, um, e to the command model with events and uh, with the query model for queries that the user interface needs to produce. So all in all, these aspects are, um, are extremely important for getting the scalability and the throughput that uh, today's software demands and still keep um, simplicity in our designs as simple as possible. This includes exchanging data or information across bounded contexts because bounded contexts pretty much never live in isolation. Um, so the bounded context on the top, you notice, is receiving a command, the blue message from the bounded context below. So the reactive part of this can be an asynchronous command message being sent to the other bounded context. It could be a REST request. We're not uh, saying that you that you cannot use REST. However, uh, as an option, you can basically fire and forget the, the command message and, and uh, have latency built into your design so that you don't expect any you know, sort of SLA based on 
well, if this um, request doesn't have a response within five seconds, it's, an, you know, it's some sort of error. Instead, uh, the, request, the response may return as an event or a document message, as you see here, at any future time. And because we're not panicked over this uh, you know, situation where it may be latent, then we simply react when it, when it happens. And I must say, five seconds would be an extremely long time for a reactive system to actually produce an outcome. Um, you know, we're usually talking in, in sub 10 milliseconds or something like that, so. Um, and then, of course, how do we arrange for bounded contexts to understand each other's languages that are available, call, often called a published language? So how do we share our schemas with dependents or how do we depend on, on other bounded contexts? We can use a uh, concept such as the schema registry, which I think is an extremely important part of, um, of the Vlingo platform that we're going to demonstrate for you. And then of course, you know, um, probably some questions are being raised in your mind right now. Yeah, so asynchrony sounds good and everything, but um, how do I deal with when something does not ever show up again? Or what if things happen out of order? What if, you know, what if both of these situations happen? I'm expecting event one and event two shows up before it. What do I do now? So uh, this has to do with, you know, some techniques that I call modeling uncertainty, and my approach to this is actually sort of pushing those decisions down to the lowest part of the uh, bounded context, which is the domain model. So you actually model the uncertainty as it is now part of a business concern, just like maybe selling products online. The fact that we're selling products online through a distributed system, um, or whether we're tracking uh, cargo or you know whatever the the sort of you know domain problem space that we're trying to solve, um, we will run into the uncertainty that distributed systems will fail. They will um, you know basically a network partition can cause messages to be delivered out of order. All kinds of things can happen, but we are deliberately trying to push that down to um, the lowest level. Um, and here are some techniques for dealing with uh, reactive. Reactive is non-blocking and it's non-sharing, so you don't share anything with anyone in a reactive system. But how do you deal with things like when blocking does actually occur with a database. You know, database um, designs are, or database drivers, for example, are largely uh, blocking synchronous. When you make uh, a SQL um, request or run a SQL query, you know, that query is going to, to provide uh, a result of some kind you know, after some blocking, and so you're blocking on I.O. How do you get around this? Well, actually, there, there's uh, what I refer to, actually, if you could go back one, yeah. Um, smart blocking is actually where you use two different pools of threads. One pool is your application pool, and another pool is your persistence pool, for example, and that way um, the, the threads are not that are being used for your application services are not being consumed by, by and blocked by I.O. So you can take these kinds of measures and this is supported in Vlingo. Also, what if you're uh, using for trying to reuse buffers, for example, pooled, pooled objects um, for I.O., something like this? Well, you can have basically a dynamic or as, as I said before, an elastic um, pool of, of reusable objects that grows when there's higher demand and will shrink so elastically as resource uh, co uh, consumption backs off a bit. So we have to take into consideration some of these uh, design techniques. And now I wanted to talk about IoT 
And I think it's, you know, for us, probably a lot of, like this, it's the internet of toys. Um, uh, and I think it's pretty cool that, you know, we have so many opportunities to use computing in ways that we never imagined before. But um, even more than cool, I think is, you know, really important is being a humanist. So for example, this morning in, in uh, one of the keynotes, the video that we saw talked about humanists and it showed uh, an image of, of someone working in a medical field or a healthcare field. And I think this is extremely important because uh, when we write software that helps people, we're not just making money and we're, just not, we're not just making um, our employers extremely wealthy, but we are actually helping people and I think this is an, very, very important. So, you know, we want to use these technologies in the best way that we possibly can as a humanist w when possible. And one of these things that we can do, for example, is create what are known as digital twins. And this is where we model, for example, the patient. We model the clinic as we need to. We model the patient's um, sentiment and their behaviors. As, a, as an actual individual, we model the machines that, that are uh, being used to treat patients as digital twins. Now, we actually have this very natural concept as a ubiquitous language, or part of a ubiquitous language, or multiple languages and multiple bounded contexts that are helping people by actually reflecting exactly what the software should be doing to help people. And, um, this is very rewarding. So, for example, you can see this patient has what appears to be good behavior and sentiment toward the treatment that he's receiving because he's at home performing dialysis at home. Of course, if he didn't do this, he would probably die very soon because of waste not being removed from his body. But we can model his behavior and his sentiment that he is uh, adhering to the treatment that he has, that he receives, as his patient digital twin. So as we uh, get through domain-driven design, we're trying to stay agile, agile as possible, true agile, where um, we're, we're performing quick increments or iterations on software which produce increments of value and, uh, and, and still modeling clinical and diagnosis uh, data and so forth and, and analytics as actual uh, real world types of reflected objects or objects that reflect the, the real world. So in Vlingo, what we emphasize is fluency. Domain-driven design, when you are um, working in a DDD uh, kind of setting, um, is much about fluency because you want the meaning of your software to reflect the meaning of, of the team's mental model about what area of the problem space you're actually providing a solution for. So even in the reusable components, um, we've, you know, we are striving to, for example, with a future sort of, you know, the promise that something will be done in the future, this is called completes. Um, it's understandable, and, and uh, when you need to perform the next task after one asynchronous task has completed, this would be done with and then, or and then two, or and then consume, and finally you can receive the, the final outcome with the with statement, or, uh, which is not even actually necessary. Now, what about modeling the machine that we're working in? We can model the machine, with vitals, with a patient interface between the treatment, and um, this is a way to capture the digital twin idea. And as we're doing so, notice that um, the machine gathers patient vitals. Doesn't that read nice and, and crisp according to the way that we would expect our team to communicate? Or treatment record vitals read. Doesn't that just sound like some conversation that we would have. And without using the expressiveness available in methods, uh, method design or what we call protocol design in Vlingo, this, this level of fluency really cannot easily be achieved. 
So here's an example of uh, a, a uh, reactive streams interface that's subscribed to machine readings and this, this uh, concept is called vitals and on next, on the next reading that's available, we are going to create a, a vitals red event and we are going to dispatch that to the treatment to be recorded, okay? So this is actually capturing important patient information. It's fluent. Now you may be concerned about the on next. No one will see that from the outside because this is just part of the interface of, subs of subscriber, okay? So don't worry about on next polluting your domain model. It's just a necessary interface for, for interacting with reactive streams. Kevin's going to talk for a while now about event sourcing. <laughs> Let's try, okay? It's off. It's on. It's off. Now? Okay. So we were talking about how to model software, uh, but the thing is how do we get the knowledge necessary to model the software, no? So one of the problems that we face is we know what's the current state of our system, but we don't know how do we get there. So we cannot evolve. We cannot measure what happened. So there are different tools. One that we support from the beginning is event sourcing. And our experience is that precisely when you are modeling some IoT software, uh, it's a technique that is a competitive advantage over other people, over other businesses. So it's important to say that event sourcing is based on perception, on what you learn from the outside system. So what you learn from your customer, what you learn from other applications. So those perceptions are usually commands that they just run on your system, like querying or adding vitals, or events from other systems, other bounded contexts that is sharing with you. In Blingo, uh, those, those commands, this information, will be processed by actors asynchronously. And actually that's fine because uh, you will not, so you will get information from the system without blocking in other actors. So you will have uh, split the, the, the load uh, during, the, during the workload of the system. Um, all those commands that will generate events, will, those events will be stored on an event journal that everyone can read and process to get information from other parts of the system and materialize views or materialize other information that will be useful. <coughs> so one example, actually this is part of the demo that we'll be showing at the end. But one of the examples is an actor that is tracking all the steps that we are doing. It's an Android application, and what it is doing is, uh, I think it might work. Let's try that. Uh, no, uh, yeah, it works nice. Um, so actors are receiving commands. A command is an action that will be eventually processed. And when an actor receives a command, it generally generates events. So it's recording facts. It's recording knowledge of what happened. This is really important because we are not uh, thinking on the persistence of the object. This is implicitly on, on event sourcing. We are generating knowledge that will be stored in the database. And I just wanted to point out one yeah. thing too, that notice that the uh, concept, the actual implementation is named track, uh, track actor but the protocol that the, that the client knows about is track, yeah. okay? So the actor is not known to the outside world. Yeah. So Blingo is type safe in terms that you are implementing, you're implementing an interface, a Java interface or a Kotlin interface. So when, when you are working with different actors, you are not actually seeing the, inter, the implementation, you are not seeing anything about how it's implemented internally, you are just seeing the interface. So it's a, like any other Java object or Kotlin object. Um, so when we are doing event sourcing, there are two parts. One is generating events from commands, like this one. In this case, uh, when a user, a hiker, is stepping, is walking, we will generate events like a step track. There will be a new step on the system. And under some conditions, we can also generate more events to get more knowledge of what is happening. But there's another part, the part of materializing this knowledge. The same actor can read its own events to actually mutate its own state. You have to, you have to talk. Yeah? You're, you're not talking. Ah, yeah, I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm moving too much. So, repeat. So we can actually read our own events or 
the facts that we already sent to materialize information in its own actor. This information can later be reused to generate more events from other commands. And the good thing about event sourcing, probably there are some drawbacks, but the good thing is that it's iterative. So it allows us to process, so to generate events, to generate information, and to process this information separately, decoupled from each other. Usually in all systems, what we have is we generate a command, we get information from the database, from some data store, we manipulate this information and store it again, losing any track of what happened. In event sourcing, we are storing facts and then we are processing it later. This way, we can perceive more information from the customer, generating more events in case that we need more information. And usually those events, there are two ways to evolve them. One is we can generate a new version. It means that we need more information. We have more knowledge of what happens uh, when this command is run. For example, we need more fields. And those events are uh, backwards compatible. So you are not breaking anything because you are getting more knowledge. What could happen is that if those events are not backwards compatible, probably it's because your assumptions at the beginning were wrong. So you are getting information that is not needed or is wrong uh, in terms of the domain. So it means that you need to iterate in a smaller steps. There's also another part, we can create new events. We can get more information, but from different users, different customers, so maybe different business areas. This means that we are adding more terms, more information on our ubiquitous language. No? We have more words to explain things. And it means that we are taking into consideration new users, new customers because we have more information about the system and the business context that we are working on. Yeah. So events are the main way. That's actually why there are a lot of techniques like event storming, no? because events are a really good way to improve and to experiment and to learn more about the business. Um, event sourcing is just taking this part to, to the code, to the actual implementation of our business application. So understanding how our users envision their business, how they think about their business, uh, and being able to reproduce this context, is really helpful and gives us a competitive advantage when we are working on. Uh, so if we can uh, reproduce the state and we can take advantage of reading everything that will happen with a single user, and we can reproduce this state on different environments, like in a stable or any staging environment. It gives us a way to debug and to understand what's happening without breaking production, for example. There are other ways to understand what happened on production. You can have uh, logs. You can have some logs on your Elasticsearch and read them on Kibana. But there are some drawbacks on this approach. One of the things that I don't know, probably a lot of people face that, but logs are usually outdated because you need to maintain them. So it's something that it's completely separate from your program, you need to maintain them, and you need to update the information that are on them. Another thing is that they are not always there. Some systems, they are just deleting them after a week, or two weeks, or a month. So if you have a problem that happened on Christmas, and you're in summer, you don't know anything about what happened. And another thing is that logs are just textual information for the programmer, for the developer, for us. So the system doesn't know anything about them. You cannot put this information in your system, read it, and get the latest stage of your application. So it's just information for you, but the system doesn't know anything about that. So when we are, when, so when we are working on IoT application, when we have a lot of sensors, a lot of different inputs, uh, and a lot of different applications that are just pushing information to, the, to our system, Recording this information in a reliable way is really important. Actually, in most applications, it's important, but IoT even more. Because this leads to a better understanding of what we are doing, about what our sensors are doing. It, there's an enrichment on the teams and the autonomy of them, because they can get this information without the need of some kind of uh, domain expert. This information is already there in the system. And it's a reliable way to improve the language, the ubiquitous language that the team is using. It's a reliable way to get more information and evolve the ubiquitous language and the model that it gets from there. 
So the main reason to use actors and in terms of domain driven design with actors is that actors explicitly model uh, the domain. So you have an actor that represents a track or a vital. You have actors that actually talk about the language of your domain. This is really useful, and actually a lot of organizations are organizing structures. So there are companies that are organizing their teams around, around the bounded contexts. If I might just interject yeah. one thought here too. When you use actors in this way, uh, you really, really do not want to have anemic domain models. So you're almost forced to not use public setters. Uh, you can if you want to, but that would prove to be a very, very bad yeah. idea. Yeah. So there's a concept that it's called active object. Uh, an active object is an, it's an object, it's an actor, actually. The thing is that this object is responsible of their own resources. So the actor is responsible of their own CPU, memory, and so on. And is responsible of their, of their time. So they are real objects. They are alive entities that are actually doing some work. And this is a useful pattern or technique to implement uh, aggregate roots and entities. Because it allows us to understand the business and model a solution for that business in the same language that they are using and in the same concepts. We don't need something to orchestrate services or application services or whatever to orchestrate domain objects. They are just alive, they just send messages to each other and they communicate. And because those actors communicate between them and this communication is explicit, the boundaries between them is also explicit. So you can build teams around them. Uh, and you can actually make explicit the breaches around teams and the communication that they will be uh, between them. From more a technical point of view, the good thing is that uh, you have a standardized stack. You have a standardized way of implementing something if you use a platform like Blingo. And actors are really efficient when you are using the CPU because they are single threaded but they can be spanned across different threads, uh, guaranteeing some consistency and, trans and transactionality on the message processing. Uh, yeah. So even driving, even driving architectures allows teams to decouple the knowledge that they gather and how other teams need to get this knowledge. So usually we face the, the issue that we have some uh, stock no? We have a warehouse with some stock and our web application needs to get information from this stock just to buy or send some or buy a car or whatever. So how do we share this information between bounded contexts? Events are a natural fit for that. So you are just sending events, you are recording facts that will happen and other bounded contexts can read from them. This is also dangerous in terms that you can have some, uh, if you are not aware that you can couple different entities uh, between different bounded contexts, it can be dangerous, but there are some patterns like the published language uh, to fix this problem and don't fail on it. Also, uh, even sourcing. The main benefit is to understand what's ha what happened on the system as we said, but the good thing is that you don't need, uh, or you are not on always having a dependency on your domain expert to understand what is happening because you have all the information. And you allow teams to be data driven. You have all the data, this data is true because it's what is building the system, and you can take decisions on that. You can always replay the data, you can always read again from scratch, and you can generate more data to get information on what happened. We have an example app. I don't know if we will have time to try. Yeah, sure. Um, yep. This Blingo works on Android. Uh, it compiles to Java 8 and Java 6. It works on Android. And it also works on the backend. Actually, it's the backend is the, where we started working on it. So we have an example application um, written in Kotlin that you can download and you can work on it, compile, play with it, whatever. We will share the, the GitHub repo at the end that actually tracks you while you are working, and you can send alarms to other people nearby you. And you will see the alarm, this red dot thing, uh, from other person nearby you. And it's just a simple application to see how actors work, how they communicate between backend and frontend, 
and, ha and how do we store events in the event journal and can be written from other parts of the system. Um, so the example application is here. So probably we have some time for questions and maybe we can do the demo. I don't know if there are any questions. I can try to run the application. I was hoping you would do the demo now because you have um, 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. you, have, you have at least five minutes for the demo. Yeah. Yeah. So if there are no questions, we can, I don't know, I, don't, I see hands, but I don't see questions. We can try to demo the application. Okay. Yeah, let's demo. But I mean, you were going to show the source code, I think, right? Uh, yeah, they should. Yeah. You want to me to walk through the whole source code? Yeah, no, not the whole thing. Just so <laughs> the source code is in Show them maybe here? what a track is. And mm -hmm. Show them what a track is and the Android ah. uh, front end a little bit. Let's see if I can enter. No, OK. So let's go to GitHub. I think you have to move to a different virtual screen. Let's go to the other screen. Hi. OK, well, Kevin's setting up. I can answer questions. Yeah. Um, great there, guys. Uh, one question is, well, there are two points that I would like to you know, comment on. First is, how do you go about like, defining your data model and, and whether you've looked at doing it across like language boundaries. Sometimes you have to go outside the JVM. How do you have a data model in a sort of asynchronous messaging system that is consistent? Mm -hmm. And if you yeah. know what is the, the, the way. Sure. And the second one is, uh, how do you go about um, you know, understanding and designing these protocols? Because they, be they can be some like, edge cases and finer points where you know, if you have to go through the network stack, things happen. You know, the real world is messy. So how do you sort of design? OK. Let me, yeah, let me answer the first question. So um, actually, we're, we're not an event sourced only um, persistence platform. We, we support um, uh, objects through, objects through events. Yeah, so basically event, event uh, sourcing, um, CQRS with a, a flat you know, sort of blob um, entity model. Uh, we, we support ORM through JPA, uh, Hibernate, and we also have yet another uh, JDBC, sort of raw JDBC through a, an interface called JDBI. It's an open source product. So we actually have four different ways that you can um, persist objects. And so you would create your data model in the, in the same way. The, the event sourcing models actually are preset um, and are relatively rich, probably all you would need. The second question, um, how do you, the real world is messy, how do you deal with designing protocols? Well, you, you get things wrong and you change the design. But, um, you know, so, so the, the actual um, method, uh, you know, declarations on an interface, on a plain Java interface, those can be changed and then if that affects the, if you're using event sourcing, for example, then you have a migration pr potentially, right? But you have a migration and OR mapping too, so it, it's really no different from. Go ahead. I'm sorry. My question was more on the like, sequencing of events. Oh, I guess well, my question was more on the yeah. sequencing of on events when, okay, when well, this happened in, in event, different order and. Yeah, events are sequenced in the order in which they occurred. So there's there's an event journal. <laughs> that uh, tracks, you know, basically, uh, um, you know, a time order of when things occurred, and that is how you read them out. If you need to consume them in a different order, then that's usually known as projection, where you're trying to, you know, interpret the, the um, event streams that, that have occurred and interpret those into some other kind of model. And you can pipeline, you can do all kinds of different things, yeah, with that, okay? Thank you. Yeah. OK. Kevin, why don't you go yeah. ahead? So the application is here on GitHub. Uh, there, will, there are two Gradle projects, one for the Android application and one plus for plus. Uh, plus plus. Zero. I think it's better now. Yeah. So there's a Gradle project for the Android application that you can run. And there is also the backend application that is Dockerized. So you can just run the Docker and see how it works. There is a Docker Compose with a PostgreSQL that we use for our, as a journal. So it should work. You just compile the application, run the Docker, 
and start the Android application, and it should work. With a, there are small things to configure, like the, the API key for Google Maps, but this is something that we need to do. Uh, yeah, and feel free to try it and give us feedback. Yeah, so, um, and you know, like Kevin said, there are kind of two um, sides to this. There's the Android uh, application that is actually implemented with Kotlin and Vlingo, and there is the server side, which is implemented with Kotlin and Vlingo. Mm -hmm. And so you can see both of those uh, models on, on both sides. And um, also, I, I know that there's a networking party tonight, and I don't want to, uh, you know, influence anyone away, but we are having a, uh, a meetup that will extend this discussion. We're having that at ThoughtWorks uh, beginning about 6.30 with some food and drinks. So, uh, yeah, I, I know this is maybe a delicate situation, but if, if you're really, really interested in this and would like to actually <coughs> use source code and get feedback from people who have used this, um, then you're, you're welcome to attend there, too. Mm -hmm. Or come late. I do give a talk that, that maybe um, will have a lot of overlap with this, so if you want to come after the networking party and, and still join us for sort of like the, the code re, uh, review and demonstrations of yeah. things. Yeah. I will be here on the networking party, so if you want to see the application running or you want to talk about how it works or you have any other question about the actor model or domain driven design or even sourcing, I will be around here, just come to me. Yeah, yeah. it's pretty amazing actually that, um, you know, I, I have some uh, contributors in the United States, there are three of us total, I think in the US, no, four in the US, and then, um, and then a, f a few people in Germany who have contributed, but actually here in, in Barcelona we've had uh, some really good um, success with with contributors and you know a, a friend Alish that uh, Kevin you know has known for a long time has helped us and and uh, Brian back here um, <laughs> working at Sky Sky, Sky Scanner <laughs> um, he's he's used it and uh, he he's bumped up against a few problems you can ask him what were the problems how they've been solved and I think we have to help you solve another one here today right we're going to do that so. Uh, we all have some time. Yeah. So, any more questions? We have, I think, is it two minutes we yeah. have? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, what would be the, your preferred way to deal with eventual consistency? So, um, <laughs> well, you know, that, that's a pretty open question. Um, what I would say is, you know, there, there's eventual consistency potentially in the query model, right, and the read model, but there's also eventual consistency um, across bounded contexts. And there's a talk that I gave, uh, and I've given several times in the past year, year and a half, uh, and I mentioned it here about modeling uncertainty. So if you go to my YouTube uh, channel and just search for Von Vernon modeling uncertainty, you'll find that. Basically what it means is let things happen as they happen and, um, and sort of absorb that into the domain model because it's the lowest possible place that, that knows how to deal with this. Um, my, my opinions are, are mine but also uh, kind of backed by Pat Helen's uh, paper, Life Beyond Distributed Transactions, his updated um, papers on the ACM, and you can read it there, and one of the m clearest statements you can find on this is he said, when you cannot use global transactions, you must model the uncertainty in business logic. And it just, you know, that's, that's the best place. If you try to create a resequencer and a deduplicator out at the edge, it's just hard, and you fiddle with it for a long time, and it's probably still not perfectly correct, and you haven't solved any business problems. So, Bring it in in house, yeah, to the domain model. As a recommendation, I will say to avoid having eventual consistency in the same bounded context or in the same domain object, at least for writing, because the relationship between information in the same bounded context is really strong. So probably having eventual consistency depending where, actually on the right model, is really dangerous. 
Yeah, the, the REAP model is just a completely different thing, mm -hmm. so that would be another discussion, I think, so, yeah. But it looks like we're out of time. <laughs> Thank you for attending. This was great. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you.